Good afternoon. I'm Jerry Bolden. I, uh, on behalf of the CPLA, I want to thank you for joining us for this 2021 focus series. Uh, today, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Laura Wittstrom uh, as she shares with us on the. Oh, I'm sorry. As she shares with us on the subject of navigating life and liturgy with children. Uh, Dr. Wittstrom is in her 11th year teaching in the theology department uh, here at Spring Arbor University. Um, prior to coming here, she served for 13 years as the director of youth and children's ministries at a United Methodist Church in her hometown of Rockford, Illinois. She also spent seven years uh, as a licensed foster parent and has adopted three children from the foster care system. Uh, Currently, she juggles her time as a mom of kids working through trauma and teaching ministry courses here at SAU. The themes she'll be sharing um, with us today are ones that she used in her ministry setting and uh, many uh, at home with her children. They have helped her family to find rhythm in their faith as they grow together. Um, I will be monitoring the chat this afternoon and we'll be having a time for questions at the end of uh, Dr. Wittstrom's presentation. Uh, thank you for sharing with us today, Dr. Wittstrom, and I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Jerry. It's good to be with you even on a computer screen. I would certainly rather be face-to-face -face in the same space. Um, so I apologize for the mess that is my backdrop. Um, let me begin with an image because I think better in pictures. So uh, maybe you, like me, had to resort to doing some YouTube workouts during this quarantine time, uh, particularly in the winter when the roads were icy and not real safe. Um, I found myself resorting to some YouTube videos for exercise. And I found a website and I found a lady that I could tolerate. And so I did quite a number of routines with her. And there was one day she was doing her exercise and uh, it was intervals. So she would do an exercise for a time and then take a break and then do another exercise. And in the middle of the exercise, she slipped. And you don't always expect that to happen when you're watching someone who has posted in a semi-professional way to slip in the middle of an exercise. And she was able to recover and finish the set. And then she made the comment, she said, I'm so sorry about that. She said, sometimes it's very difficult to film these because I have to be in a completely white room and I lose my bearings. And I thought that is a really profound statement. She, she didn't have any distinction between the wall and the floor, everything was white so that as they took the tape from her exercises, they could drop in whatever background they wanted so it looked nice and uh, appropriate to post on the web. Um, but I think that there's a little bit of a metaphor for life in that. Maybe you felt that, maybe you were quarantined for a bit during this last season and you lost the activities that sort of gave your week that rhythm. You weren't able to attend church on Sunday or you weren't able to get up and go to school or work on Monday. Uh, you missed your gym date on Tuesday. All of those things that gave rhythm to the days of your week were suddenly gone and maybe you too found yourself asking, what day is it? I've asked myself that so many times during the past year because I've lost those places that give me bearing. One other picture to add, uh, when I was young, I took gymnastics classes. And when we were first learning the balance beam, I remember my instructor saying to me, you're going to feel like you want to look down and watch your feet because you wanna make sure that your feet are actually on the beam. But she said, if you do that, you will lose your balance and you will fall. And she said, the better choice is to set your sight at the end of the beam way out in front of you, pick a place and look there. And if you lock your eyes there, you're gonna be able to walk across the beam balanced without falling. And she was right. And that has stuck with me um, since I was probably six or seven and took that class. <clears throat> that when we have reference points in life, we just do better, we know where we are. And so today in our conversation, we're gonna be talking about some of those reference points that we can use with children so that we can keep our bearings. I'm gonna share some slides with you here. <clears throat> 
So this is navigating life and liturgy with children. How can we help children experience God through rhythms and practices that help bring, hang on, your faces are blocking my screen, meaning to the mysteries of faith. In this session, we will explore intentional experiences that can be built into daily life to nurture the faith of a child. Now, as a little side note, about halfway through, um, we will pause for an activity. So if you have a pair of scissors and a couple sheets of paper handy, you can participate in the activity. Otherwise, you're welcome just to, to watch along with us. <clears throat> you have to, uh, excuse me, I'm getting over a sinus infection. So there's still some throat clearing going on here. Um, in scripture, we have a lot of examples of the idea of rhythm. Right away in the story of creation in Genesis, we have the pattern. We work for six days, we rest for one. God establishes that very early. Even the way that the earth turns so that we have night and day in a rhythmed fashion, the way that the earth orbits around the sun to give us the year, all of that gives credence to this idea that there's value in this rhythm, in this pattern. And then the second point, uh, and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And that idea of, of taking the bread and the cup and Jesus reminding us to do this as often as we think of it in remembrance of him. So that pattern that do this regularly when you gather to worship, it's not like once and done, but really this is something that's gonna build meaning when we repeat that practice. And then the third one, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And when we look at the contextual background of that, it doesn't seem like this was a, a, a one-time event. This looks like it was something that Jesus did pretty typically. So in scripture, we have a lot of evidence that rhythms and patterns were part of the way God intended for us to experience creation. Now, if you spend time working with children, a chart like this is certainly very familiar. Um, those who work with children understand that when there's rhythm and predictability, kids usually do better. So we can ask that question, why is that? Why do kids do better? Well, if you think about the life of a child, adults are making decisions for them all day long. The adults decide when you get up, when you get ready for school, the adults are deciding um, oftentimes extracurricular activities or where you will play or where you will spend your Saturday. And so a child doesn't often have a lot of control over their environment. So one way that we can extend some control to them is helping them know what's next. When they know what's next and what to expect, a lot of times that can calm fears and give a kid a sense of control over their own environment. Now, as a foster parent working with kids who've experienced trauma, this became even more important. One of the things that I discovered through trial and error was that when I first had a kid come to my home, one of the most significant things I could do would be to get them into a routine as quickly as possible. Because if you think about the experience of a child being removed from their birth home, as dysfunctional as it may be, it's traumatizing to be removed from everything you know. Everything in your world feels out of control. And so in order to help them feel secure, you need to give them a sense of control. So if they know what to expect, they feel in control of their environment, they're able to settle and hopefully build some bonds and attachments that will help them to be successful in their foster placement. Now, when my boys came to me, my boys are now eight and 10. When they came to me, they were 22 months and three years old. They came from a pretty dysfunctional home and I learned really quickly that they didn't even have a sense of what a day was. Um, their mom was on disability and so she never left the home to go to work. Um, they rarely left the home for any reason. So they didn't have cues like church on Sunday, we go to school on Monday, or we go to the library on Tuesday, or we play at the park on Wednesday. There was none of that in their life. And they also didn't even have a daily schedule. So they didn't eat and sleep at normal times. Um, it was more of a haphazard way of going through their day. 
So while I think of time in a linear fashion, like I get up in the morning, I get ready, I go to work, I move across my day linearly, and then I move through my Monday and then my Tuesday and then my Wednesday. For my boy, boys, it was more of a circular experience where it was eat, play, sleep eat, play, sleep, eat, play, sleep. And they just repeated those three things again and again. They also hung blankets over their windows. So they didn't even have the cues of light and dark. They didn't know that dark meant you should go to bed. They didn't know that light came in the daytime. So our first schedule was very similar to this, where we started with a picture of a sun and the sun was the first thing that started their day. And then came a picture of a banana because that was one of their favorite breakfast items. And then the picture of the toothbrush, a picture of their daycare. And so a typical day easily had 10, 12 pictures that walked them through their day all the way to a picture of a bed with a moon over it to help them understand that that symbolized bedtime. So we used that calendar for probably close to two years until they had really gotten comfortable and familiar with our routines. And then we simplified a bit, a bit and we went to a wall calendar with the little squares, but I would still put key pictures in for each day. So if we had school and then maybe soccer practice, there would be a picture of their school and the soccer ball. And that was helpful to cue them. And now that they're school age, we've moved on to just writing the words um, on the calendar because they're able to read that. But even though they've been with me now for seven years, we still have a practice of every night at dinner, we talk about the next day. And we talk about what the next day will be like. And that's a concept called front loading. And some kids do well with front loading, other kids become overwhelmed when you give them information ahead of time and it, it prevents them from being present in the moment. So you kind of have to know your kid and, and which side they fall on, whether front loading is helpful or not. For my kids, it's very helpful and we can't go too far ahead. That's another thing that I've learned. So we don't talk about next week. We don't even typically talk about two days from now. We talk about the next day because as uh, we've been wisely told, today has enough trouble of its own. All right, so for children, routines can help reduce stress from the unknown. The definition of growing up is that their bodies and environments are continually changing. And so figuring out how to navigate that change is really helpful. It also helps our kids to know what's valuable and important because we repeat those things that are valuable. So if we repeat it, it must be important. They also know what to expect, and that creates a calmer environment. They know that their basic needs are being met because they got breakfast yesterday, so they're probably gonna get breakfast tomorrow because they've seen that pattern accumulate over time. A rhythm or a routine can help kids know what to do and how to do it by oneself, and that creates independence and builds confidence. So rather than holding their hand and walking them through the steps of their day, they begin to be able to do those steps independently, and then that builds healthy skills and habits. It offers things to get excited about. My children look forward to the next holiday and the rhythms and the routines that we will practice as a part of that. It provides stability in life when other elements are changing, and it helps kids fall asleep at night, regulating their biological rhythms. So kids are just better when they have some predictability in their lives. So this picture, if you've been in class with me and I saw a lot of familiar names and faces out there, this is very familiar because almost every semester we start with a coloring activity uh, that looks something like this. And I, I found a nicer version of it for the slide. This is called the liturgical calendar. And for those of you unfamiliar, let me give you a little bit of a background for the liturgical calendar. So if you think about your typical calendar, whether it hangs on the wall or it's in digital form in the palm of your hand, when a particular time of year comes up on the calendar, it acts as a cue for you to do certain things. So if you flip your calendar to the month of October, what are the things that you typically do? You go to the orchard, you buy pumpkins, you drink pumpkin spice things. Um, that's what you do when you flip the calendar to October. 
when you flip the calendar to December. You make sure your Christmas lights are hung, you decorate the tree, maybe you decorate cookies or bake a fruit cake, you do your shopping. So the calendar gives us cues. Well, in the church, we have a calendar and that gives us cues for our spiritual life. And so there are several different traditions that practice the liturgical calendar, and some are aware of it and reference it occasionally. So there's sort of a spectrum of use of the liturgical calendar. I find it really helpful, especially in working with children, because it's colors, it's symbols, and it's a pattern. And those things all lend themselves really well to working with children. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some slight variations between traditions. <clears throat> but right now we are in the season of Lent. So we are right here on this slice of pizza and Lent is a season of preparation. And so in the church, we can use purple or blue for seasons of preparation. We are preparing right now for the season of Easter. We started Lent with Ash Wednesday back here and we are moving towards Holy Week and then Easter, which is actually a whole season. Um, <clears throat> beyond just the one day. So this is where we are. And churches that practice the liturgical calendar will use pieces of fabric called pyramids. And I have some pyramids here. This is a pyramid for the season of Lent. So you'll notice the color purple. You'll see the cross and the crown of thorns. So symbols very appropriate for the season. And so a church would take a pyramid such as this and put it on the altar, maybe on the podium or the lectern where the Bible is read. And the pastor would also use a strip of this colored fabric and it would be around the pastor's neck coming down on each side. And that's called a stole. And there's symbolism behind that. If we think back to biblical farming practices, uh, they didn't have a tractor to plow the field, but they would put a yoke over the shoulders of the ox or the cow or whatever the animal was, and that animal would bear the weight of the plow as the farmer guided the plow. And so in many traditions, when a pastor is ordained and formally recognized as a pastor in that tradition, that's when they receive their stole. It's placed over their shoulders at symbolically, recognizing that they're not bearing the physical weight of the congregation, but they're taking on the spiritual weight of the congregation and they're putting that upon their shoulders. And so that's a really helpful image as we think about the role of a pastor. So during the season of Lent, there's a lot of different things that we can do to draw kids into this practice. So starting with, uh, there's Lent, um, starting with Ash Wednesday, this is a practice that many churches participate in. Now you might have heard historically that this is a Roman Catholic practice. And historically, it probably was more limited to that tradition, but more and more other traditions are beginning to incorporate this practice. And it's called the imposition of the ashes. So the ashes are imposed upon your forehead. Now, these aren't just ashes like from your pastor's fireplace. These ashes actually have meaning behind them as well. If, if we follow tradition and history, what happened is that the church saved a couple palm branches from the previous Palm Sunday, dried them out. Um, maybe they tucked them like up in the edge of a bulletin board or in the rafters of a meeting space so people could see them even as they gathered all throughout the year. And then on Ash Wednesday, th that, those palm branches that were dry would be burned, mixed with just a tiny bit of oil, and then the mixture is right so that the ashes will stick. And the pastor or the priest will say something along the lines of, from ashes you came, and from ashes and to ashes you will return. So this idea that your life is finite, referencing Genesis and the story of creation where we were made from dust, and then referring to what happens after we die and our bodies decay, and hopefully our spirit goes on, but our body will not. So Lent is a season of recognizing that our life is very finite. It has a beginning, it has an end, and what are you doing with that time in between? A lot of people during the season of Lent will 
participate in a practice of sacrifice. Not that giving up your coffee or your chocolate is equivalent to Jesus dying on the cross, but just doing something that helps you identify with the practice of sacrifice. So last year, my oldest, who was nine at the time, gave up playing Minecraft for the season of Lent. I didn't think he could do it. Uh, for him, that was a tremendous sacrifice, and he was able to pull it off. I was very impressed with that. So in both children's ministry and with my family, we have practiced the imposition of ashes. So something that we did in church is that we found a couple baby dolls that were plastic. So um, we weren't working with anything fabric and we had some ashes and we gave the kids the opportunity to practice dipping their finger in the ashes and painting the cross on the forehead of the baby dolls and reciting those words from ashes you came and to ashes you will return. And then we had baby wipes available to quickly wipe that off, clean that up, and then give the next person the turn. This past year, uh, just actually just a few weeks ago, um, we, we haven't chosen to return face to face to our church, but I didn't want to let Ash Wednesday go by unrecognized. And so we took our palm branches at home. Now we hadn't attended last year, so our palm branches were cut from construction paper, but nevertheless, we had them tucked right by our coat hooks where we saw them every day. We took those construction paper palm branches, we burned them in the fireplace, and then we took them and um, the kids allowed me to make the cross on their foreheads. And we talked about the season of Lent and what it means. Um, my son did not choose to give up any video games this year, um, uh, but maybe next year. Um, another thing that we do during the season of Lent is that we omit a word from our singing we omit the word hallelujah. Hallelujah is a very happy word and it means praise God. And because Lent is a time of reflection, it's not historically appropriate to use that word. And so there are a lot of churches that will be very intentional not to sing that word during the season of Lent. So something that I've done with children is to make a big banner. Uh, of the word hallelujah. So we would do it in some way where everyone could participate, whether everyone had markers and we rolled it out on butcher paper across the floor, or some years we tore construction paper and made it a mosaic, something so that we had a big banner that said hallelujah. And then we would literally roll it up and put it away. And then every week when we gathered, we would go through the process of asking the questions, why have we put our hallelujahs away? Well, that's a very happy praise God kind of word. And this is a season where we're reflecting, we're thinking about our relationship with Jesus. And so we don't sing that word right now. But then at the end of the season, when you come back on Easter Sunday, what is the word that you sing again and again and again? Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. The hallelujahs come back and so it comes full circle. So that's another practice that you could do with children. We're not doing a lot of singing in our home church because that is not an area of my giftedness. So we have not practiced that one this year. Another cool one is to be able to make palm crosses. So when you're the children's pastor, it's your job to order the palm branches every year. And so there's actually two different kinds that you can order. And sometimes the pastors have preferences, as I've learned. So I think most of us have seen the typical ones that you see, like they look like they've been pulled off a tree in Florida and just separated and then distributed to the kids. And it looks like a giant fan and they wave them. But there are also these palm strips that you can order. Um, and sometimes our pastors would prefer that I order these. Um, so another thing that we can do with these palm strips is to make them into the shape of a cross. So this is a craft that we won't do together today, but I just wanted to show you the idea. And this was an activity we did with my elementary school kids at church as we followed these directions and walked through the process. And even my first graders were able to do this with a little bit of help. And it ends up being a shape, the shape of a cross, which is just kind of a nice memento to take home uh, and to be able to keep and remember Palm Sunday. 
Uh, another one, this is even trickier. So this is taking that same palm strip and weaving it into the symbol of the Christian fish. If I remember correctly, I challenged my middle schoolers to this one, but I did not tackle this one with the elementary school kids. Um, so just kind of another cool image that you could keep uh, symbolically during the season of Lent. There's all of the instructions. And this is more our style. I know this picture looks really weird. So let me explain it for a second. This is called a resurrection roll. And this is something that my kids and I make every Easter. So we take um, the, the Pillsbury roll out dough, you know, where the, 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 the tube pops open and everything's like in the shape of a triangle. And we take those out and we lay them out on the counter and the kids take turns um, taking a marshmallow, a big marshmallow, rolling it in melted butter and then rolling it in cinnamon. And then you lay it in the triangle of dough. You fold all the pieces over and then flip it upside down. So that marshmallow is as tucked in as you can possibly make it. And you bake it for the appropriate amount of time and then when you take the, the rolls out of the oven, you crack them open. And what's happened is the marshmallow has melted. And so there's an empty space on the inside. And so we talk about how Jesus was put into the grave and they sealed it up. And three days later, when they came back and opened it, it was empty. And so we retell that story every year. And even last year, my two-year-old was able to participate in this and really enjoyed that. So this is something we did in church. Uh, that the kids enjoyed because they're really good rolls. They're like cinnamon sugar bread. So that's a win with kids. And it's an opportunity to retell the story. And it really is kind of fun to like pop it open and see that empty space and then reflect on the meaning of the story. Um, also, this is, this is kind of a longer lesson. So let me give you a little bit of background on this. This was a lesson that we did with an egg carton and 12 plastic eggs. So there's many different versions of this. I'm just gonna show, actually, I'm gonna show you two versions. One that's more crafty and one that's used, that, that uses Legos. So you could decide which one you prefer. So this crafty one that we did, um, every kid got an empty egg carton and 12 plastic eggs. And then there's a whole long list of supplies here because what happens is you, you have 12 different symbols and you talk about the meaning of those symbols. The kids create the symbols, put them in each egg and they take home sort of a kit to retell the Easter story on their own to their family. So if we start here in egg number one, uh, when we think about Jesus's last week on earth, that week began with an important day. What was the name of the day and what happened? The day was Palm Sunday. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem, people put down palm branches and shirts or cloaks on the ground as a sign of their respect. So what could we put inside of our egg? We could put a shirt. And so what they had there was little cardboard patterns for a t-shirt. So they would cut out a tiny t-shirt from a piece of fabric and that fabric went in that first egg and so they could retell the story of Palm Sunday and how people laid palm branches and cloaks down on the ground. In the second egg, um, it was talking about washing the disciples' feet and so they cut a small piece of terry cloth to represent a towel and they put that little towel piece inside their egg Egg number three, um, this was when Jesus and his disciples had their final meal together. We used model magic. If you've never encountered model magic, it's incredible. It's like Play-Doh, but it's it dries and it stays in that shape. So it's like kid modeling clay. It's way less messy than modeling clay. So in children's ministry, I bought this stuff in bulk because we, we used it all the time. So they would make a little teeny tiny cup. And in a short amount of time, that little tiny cup out of ma model magic would dry. And they put that in their egg. And then it was a reminder of the Last Supper. Egg number four is the soldiers arresting Jesus. They didn't have handcuffs, so what did they use to keep Jesus? Probably a piece of rope. So we actually used a piece of twine, really rough twine. So they got to cut a piece of twine off of a long roll and put that into their egg. 
Um, we also gave them the scripture references to go along with this. So if they got home and forgot one, they could look it up. Um, egg number five was a small piece of leather that they cut off from a larger piece to remind them um, of the whip and how Jesus was beaten. Egg number six, they took two small sticks and tied them together with string in the shape of a cross. Egg number seven, they colored the inside black um, to talk about the sky turning black when Jesus died. Egg number eight, um, they took half of a toothpick and dipped the end in red paint and let that dry. And that was symbolic of the sword that pierced Jesus's side. Egg number nine, uh, they had a small piece of purple fabric to represent the temple curtain tearing in two. Egg number 10, they had a small stone to remind them of the stone in front of the tomb. Egg number 11 was empty to remind them of the empty tomb. And egg number 12, we had a little fun with. We took two little pom-poms that were yellow or orange and we had some wiggly eyes and a foam beak and we made a chick to symbolize new life. Um, we wanted something that was familiar to them that would symbolize the new life. So they took home that egg carton with all of those symbols and then they were able to retell that story to their family. This is the Lego version. So you see the little, that must be Lego Jesus in there. Um, and they made symbols out of Legos, which is kind of fun. I don't know where you find quite all of these sets. And I definitely couldn't reproduce this for 80 Sunday school kids, um, but a fun idea. So I've seen many different versions of these resurrection eggs, but it's the idea of symbols in eggs to tell the story. Another one that we did was just talking about symbols. And we had we showed the kids a whole bunch of symbols related particularly to Holy Week. And then we had them put them in order so that they understood the progression of events during Holy Week, which begins Palm Sunday and then ends on Easter. So Palm Sunday, um, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. Um, so we could use palm branches. We could use like a Bible cloak. We could use a stuffed donkey. Any of those would work to represent represent Palm Sunday, we happen to use a palm branch. Um, for Thursday, we remember the Last Supper on Thursday, Monday, Thursday of Holy Week. And so we had a communion chalice, which is the fancy cup. A lot of people want to call it a goblet, um, but it's actually the, the, it's called a communion chalice, the cup and the bread symbolizing that last meal that Jesus ate with his disciples. And then also a basin and towel. So the foot washing that was part of that final time together. We had praying hands in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we had kind of a little statue of praying hands. I think it was plastic because that's usually safest with kids. Um, on Thursday, there was also a piece of rope to symbolize the arrest. There was a cross on Friday to symbolize Jesus being nailed to the cross. So then the activity was putting those in order so that they understood that progression. Also, I, I'm sorry, there's another page to this. Um, we also had a temple curtain. So we had a piece of fabric torn in two. And then we had the empty tomb um, for Easter Sunday. <clears throat> All right, here is our first activity. So I'm gonna do this right along with you. So you're gonna begin with a sheet of regular white printer paper and you can choose whether to use the dots or not. I'm gonna put the dots on because I haven't done this in a while, so I probably need all the help I can get. And as it says, the dots will not impact your final product. So you're gonna fold the lower left corner of the paper diagonally until the bottom meets the side, just like the picture shows. So it looks like that. I'll give you just a second to catch up. All right, so we've got our dots in our fold number one. <clears throat> now we're gonna take the bottom right and fold it up to meet that other corner. So it kind of looks like a pointy pocket at this point. We've still got our dots for reference. All right, then we're on to fold number three. We're gonna flip this guy up. It looks a little bit like a hat now at this point. 
on to number four. Pick up the paper and flip it over sideways. And I gotta make sure I'm doing this right. You will not see your dots. They will be face down. Fold it sideways again. Wait a minute, now I'm confused. Oh, I, I think it's like this. <laughs> All right, and then we're gonna to go to the next one. Visualize about an inch from the fold, you will tear through all the layers of this imaginary line. For younger children, you could draw a line. Teachers may have to help the younger children with the tearing. So you're gonna tear down evenly about an inch from the fold. So you're gonna tear off the dot parts. That part. Even if your tear is ragged, that's okay. The wood on the cross was rough. So the farther away from the fold you tear, the fatter your cross will be. So discard the pieces of paper with the dot, open the main piece, and hopefully we have a cross. So that's just kind of a fun one to be able to do with kids and retell the story. There's, here's the next one. This is a little bit more advanced. So we, again, we have a sheet of paper and it, there's a, a, a cue here. When a fold is made, don't unfold it before going on. So step one, fold the paper so that one folds to meet side B at point four. This would be much more fun if we were in the classroom doing this together. Huh. All right, everybody made it that far. I'm gonna go to the next one. Now we're gonna fold point two down to meet side A at point three. Okay, and then step three, we're gonna double the paper vertically. I think that means fold it. So side B is even with side A. All right, I'm gonna move to the next one. Double the paper vertically again, so that D is even with AB. And then you're going to cut vertically along the middle of the folded paper, cutting through all the thicknesses on line E, which isn't shown in that diagram. All right, I'm going to move to the next slide. So you should have this collection of pieces as you unfold things. And then we're gonna use these to tell the story. So I'm unfolding my pieces so they're ready here. There's a lot of pieces. Okay. So piece number one, down in the earth, a hole was made while on the cross, our Lord was laid. So this becomes sort of the foundation at the bottom. Upon that cross, they raised him high that for our sins, the Lord should die. So we would put the cross above right into that little slot. Um, above the cross, a sign they used, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Let me go back and make sure I'm grabbing. Yeah. So we... We get one of these rectangles and we put it above the cross for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The soldiers gambled at the cross. So the two little tiny squares end up being like dice um, 
to win Christ's robe and gained but loss. One thief just scoffed and turned away. So one of these represents the thief turning away. Uh, no faith had he in Christ that day. The other thief to Jesus turned. So his face turned to Jesus, believing he of heaven learned. Into the Savior's precious side, a spear was driven when he died. So for this one, we keep it folded. So you have that little point. Upon this cross for you and me, he died from sin to set us free. Because he loves me with such love, he is my Savior from above. Now, you might be able to tell from the typing on this that this is pretty old. This is something that I was actually taught when I was a kid, and I haven't found it in any other place. And so I just took the old typewriter version and copied it into lessons. So it's another way to just teach the kids to be able to go home and retell the story, practice telling the story, because in that repetition, the, the lesson begins to stick better. Another great one is making pretzels. We did this during the pandemic last year during Lent. We actually made ours from scratch, but you can also use bread dough. So you can set it up. What do you think pretzels have to do with prayer? And you can think of the shape of a pretzel and how it kind of reminds us of how we fold our arms together in prayer. Now, sometimes you can use it as a symbolism of like hugging or embracing, but it can also just be like putting our hands together in prayer. So this recipe uses frozen bread dough. That's what we did in Sunday school. So our teachers weren't having to mix up bread dough from scratch. Um, and so it just kept it a little bit more simple simplified. Uh, at home last year, we had yeast and we did the whole thing. Uh, while the pretzels bake, you can ask some questions. What prayers do you know? Do you know the Lord's Prayer? Do you know, now I lay me down to sleep? The pretzel reminds us that we can fold our hands to pray. It is, is it a requirement that you must always fold your hands? Why or why not? What if you're driving? So it's a great conversation starter for prayer postures. And we can talk about why we close our eyes, why we kneel. Um, and then at, at the end, it says, before Jesus died on the cross, people couldn't pray to God. People had to go to their church leaders and ask the church leaders to pray, the priests of the time. So emphasizing that it's a wonderful gift that we can now talk to God for ourselves. We can talk to God anytime and any place. So we don't have to cross our arms, fold our hands, but it can just be a helpful practice. Um, we're skipping a little bit ahead now, after the season of Lent, after Easter, um, we have summer. And in summer, it's actually called ordinary time. And in ordinary time, we would use the color green. So this is my green pyramid. And green symbolizes growth. And so it reminds us that even though it's not a big season of the church year, it doesn't mean we get to sit around and not do anything spiritually. So it's a time where we continue growing. So one of the uh, practices that we've incorporated in my house is a thankfulness pumpkin. So all during the month of November, every night at dinner, we go around the table and share something we're thankful for. And we kind of write it in this twirly pattern around a small pumpkin. And this is our centerpiece for the month of November. And so we fill our pumpkin by the end of the month, like this size pumpkin is really good for us. So this was probably about 10 days in. And it's a really good practice for us to think about those things that we're thankful for. And it also is like fun conversations. Uh, like you can see at the bottom, Miss Becky and Mr. Dave are our neighbors and the kids had had a good day uh, visiting with them. And so I was able to text Miss Becky and say, guess what, Miss Becky, you guys made the thankfulness pumpkin today. And so that was just a fun connection with our neighbors. Um, so back to the Christian year. So we talked about Lent, we got into Holy Week, and Easter is actually a season that's 50 days long. And so Easter is not just that one day, um, but Easter, the Easter season typically covers um, April, May, and sometimes even a bit into June. For Easter in the church, we would use the color white. So you see some gold symbolism on there. Um, but we actually use the color white. We use that for Easter and Christmas because those are the most important days. And then 50 days after Easter, we have a day called Pentecost. And on Pentecost, we use the color red and you'll notice the symbolism there. 
On Pentecost, if we're thinking chronologically, this is after Jesus has died on the cross, rose from the grave, had food with his disciples, and now the disciples are like, okay, now what? What are we doing? Because Jesus has returned to heaven. And this is really the baton passing. This is when God is saying, I'm not going to walk around with you in physical form anymore, but it is your time to be the church. I'm giving you my spirit as a gift to fill you. And so the spirit came down in Pentecost in tongues of fire. And so there's our tongues of fire. Um, also, the other symbol we have here is the dove, um, because the Holy Spirit took a physical form twice in scripture, the dove at baptism and the tongues of fire at Pentecost. So if you're playing Bible trivia with your roommates tonight, then you, you're good at this question. You're, you're set. So we consider Pentecost to be the birthday of the church, not your church, but the church universal and so there are many churches that will forego coffee and donuts or their cookies or whatever they usually have and they'll make a birthday cake a birthday cake for the church and kids are always on board with making birthday cake and so many years we employed the kids to help make birthday cake <clears throat> and to have that as our celebration um, of pentecost after Pentecost, we have the time after Pentecost or this ordinary season, and this is pretty long. So this is summer and fall all together. And then the next thing we have is the season of Advent. And Advent is another season of preparation. So in the church, we can use purple or we can use blue. So my Advent pyramid is blue. And you might recognize the Alpha, the Omega, and the Star of David. And those are all very meaningful symbols to us. So during the season of Advent, a couple of things that we can do, we can light our candles. So around the wreath, um, your wreath maybe might look something like this, especially if it's from Sunday school with that fake greenery in there. Um, but each of the, the weeks have a theme, hope, peace, love, joy. And so my family has, this is our Advent wreath. A little bit fancier than the Sunday school version. So we have um, wise men traveling to Bethlehem. We have shepherds watching a star. So we have scenes from the Christmas story all around the edge. And then we put our candles in here. And this is what we have every night at dinner. We have the four candles all around the edge. And the kids really look forward. They call it eating dinner by candlelight, even though we leave the lights in the kitchen on. Um, and then the other cool piece is that center candle. That center candle is called the Christ candle. And if you would go to a service midnight Christmas Eve, which I don't recommend doing with children, um, that Christ candle would be brought into the sanctuary and added to the center of the wreath. So this is our Christ candle. And we put that in the center of our wreath. And um, Anytime we do church at home, which has been a lot lately, we light our Christ candle and I'll ask the kids, why do we do this? Why do we light the Christ candle? And they've learned now to be able to say, to remind us that Jesus is with us. And so that's part of our practice. And at home, we don't have the cool pyramids, um, but this is our Advent pyramid. It's blue construction paper. Our uh, purple pyramid, we have some crosses on here. That's for Lent. This is our uh, ordinary time with a lot of candle wax on it. So that's as classy as we get at my house. Um, when we would do this at church, we had candles with little cups on them. And so the kids were able to take uh, a lit candle and go over and light that. And so different kids got to practice that each week. And it was a big honor. Um, do I need to hop? Can you guys make sure you're muted? We've got some side conversations going on here. So there's our Sunday school version. Another cool idea is the Jesse tree. So the concept of the Jesse tree is to make ornaments with symbols very specific to the Christian story. So I remember being in Sunday school and making these on orange juice can lids. You know, if you buy a frozen can of orange juice, you've got that metal circle. And we had to collect those for months ahead of time. And then we painted the different symbols and made a Jesse tree. 
So there's a lot of different symbols you can do here. So you can do a star for the story of Abraham. You can do a baby for the story of Sarah. So it's working through Jesus's lineage and thinking about all of the different relatives that are significant in biblical story and making an ornament for each of them so that together you can kind of have a whole picture like these are all of Jesus's relatives. And then if you look at the top of the one on the right, like little baby Jesus gets to be right here at the top. And then these are all the relatives, excuse me, that contributed to his lineage. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, lots of different ornaments you can paint on lots of different orange juice can lids. Then we have something called the Chrismon tree. And the Chrismon tree originated with the Lutherans um, to tell the story of Christmas through symbols. Chrisman ornaments are typically white and gold, so they're not very colorful. And we decided to do a Chrisman tree at my home church where I served. And so we made all of our ornaments out of pipe cleaners and uh, beads. So some of the ornaments we did, we did a good shepherd. So this is the idea of the shepherd's crook um, woven together with the fish. And so our kids were able to make all of these ornaments following these patterns. Uh, a simple cup to help us think about communion and the blood of Christ. We have a fish with a basket of bread, a circle of love where it just kind of keeps going and looping around. This is God's never ending love part one, because it gets trickier. So you end up making like three of these fish and sticking them all together. Then there's the secret sign, which ends up getting to be a little bit more elaborate as well. Um, and then there's other ornaments that you can make as well. There's the Cairo, the Iota Chi, the star. Um, all of these are different ornaments. We cut a lot of these out of foam core, which is foam in different thicknesses. And then we were able to um, attach little hooks. So when we decorate our sanctuary at Christmas, we actually have a Christmas tree. We don't have a Christmas tree, we have a Christmas tree. And then we use these ornaments and we recycle them year after year. And we remember and talk about the symbols and what they mean. And so it's just a little bit of a different twist on a typical Christmas tree. Other symbols of Advent. So this is another activity we could do like matching symbols and the meaning, working with holly and a dove and a nativity scene, an angel, a star. The poinsettia even has several different traditions. So here's a legend of the poinsettia. So there's different versions of this that you could utilize in storytelling with kids. So we're back to uh, Advent here, our four weeks of preparation, and then the Christmas season. Now, Christmas is actually more than just one day in the church calendar. Um, maybe you've heard a song, the 12 days of Christmas. So if we count from December 25th all the way to January 6th, we get 12 days of Christmas. I've even known families that instead of their kids opening a pile of presents Christmas morning, they get one gift a day for 12 days to really live out the 12 days of Christmas. And the mothers will comment on how they can take advantage of after Christmas sales to do some shopping. And sometimes if one sibling gets the toy, then the other one realizes, oh, that's really what I want to do. And then you could take advantage of those 12 days of Christmas. But it also means that the Christmas season being 12 days long means that you have that much time until you need to take down your Christmas lights. January 6th is Epiphany and that's when it ends. And so those Christmas lights should come down unlike my former neighbor who would wait for a summer storm to blow hers down. So Epiphany, we remember the visit of the wise men. So when we have our little nativity scenes, we put Jesus in the manger and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men, everybody's in that little stable. But if we look carefully at scripture, there's some separation in time. The wise men probably came a bit later. Jesus was likely a toddler, a preschooler, a little bit older by the time that the wise men came. And so Epiphany gives us a cue to just separate those events by a few days uh, in our remembering in the church year. So in a liturgical church, whatever Sunday is closest to January 6th, the, the sermon would at least reference the visit of the wise men and give homage to that. 
So that takes us around our circle of the liturgical calendar. A couple of other ideas just to throw in, if one month of the thankfulness pumpkin is not enough, um, I know a family that does a gratitude jar and once a week they sit down together and write something that they're thankful for that God did for them that week. And then they collect that all year and on New Year's Eve, they sit down together as a family and dump out the jar and we read those things to help one another remember God's faithfulness. Um, building worship traditions at home can be a lot of fun. You can, if, if you took every one of these practices, you'd probably make yourself crazy. So there's a little picking and choosing that needs to happen. What's going to work for your family? But thinking about the themes of like prayer and scripture and traditions, and how can you build those into things that are meaningful for your family? So I had just a couple of miscellaneous thoughts at the end. Something that's been significant for our family is picking up trash on our block or at a park for Earth Day, but framing it as caring for God's creation. And so we did that last year on our block and my kids were surprised that they were not able to carry home all of the trash that we picked up just on our block. And so we'll, we're getting ready to do that again in a few weeks. Um, and we'll again frame it as taking care of the earth that God has given us. Uh, making a May Day basket, um, that's just sort of an old tradition. Um, and I did that as a child, but last year we were just looking for things to fill our day. And so we spent several days preparing a May Day basket for our neighbor and framing it as a, a way to be kind and show kindness to our neighbors. So the kids made several different kinds of craft flowers. We baked something, we decorated a basket and we brought it over and left it, rang the doorbell and ran away. And our neighbor enjoyed receiving that. Uh, another tradition is lighting a candle on the anniversary of one's baptism, especially if you're part of a tradition that practiced infant baptism or childhood baptism. Sometimes it's hard for kids to remember. So my kids were baptized as children, and so we were given these baptism candles. So it's a special fancy candle that goes in a box, and on it, it has a picture of uh, a dove and a seashell and water. So all baptism symbols. And this, the idea is that you pull this out once a year on the anniversary of your baptism. And it has information on here. This is my son Luke's um, candle. So it has the date, the location, the pastor and the godparents names. All of that is on there. And so the idea is you pull it out and then light the candle and on that day you retell the story of baptism whether that's verbally or sharing pictures so this is coming up this is coming up uh in uh, march 27th i better keep this out so that i don't forget to remember his baptism um all saints day is another tradition that some faith some faiths practice and others do not. So All Saints Day is historically tied in a little bit with Halloween. So the idea being that on the night between October 31st and November 1st, that's the time where the veil between the living and the dead is at its thinnest. And so people would wear masks originally so that they couldn't be recognized by anyone haunting that night. And that of course morphed into our Halloween. Um, but then the church has really grabbed on to November 1st as All Saints Day. So many churches will remember the saints that have gone before. My home church has a beautiful practice of remembering people in the congregation that have died that previous year. Um, but something that we started at home um, is we took pictures of relatives. So this is a picture of my grandpa and me when I was two. So we took, a, we took pictures of probably six or seven of our relatives that have died. And then I made little cards that had just some basic facts about that family member. So some things that they liked, some things that stood out. Um, so like this one, this one says, worked at the bakery, told silly jokes, liked fishing and swimming and built model airplanes. So my kids did a matching activity and this was grandpa Schumann. And so they matched that card with my grandpa. And so even though they they were never able to meet this grandpa, they still have a point of reference. And we can talk about too, 
um, some of the cards talk about elements of their faith and the way that their faith was exhibited. And so we'll pull this out every year. Maybe one year I'll get fancier than three by five cards, but maybe not. Uh, maybe we'll stick with that. So we pulled out the pictures, we did the matching, and it was a neat way to be able to share memories and uh, to be able to connect them to the people that have gone before. Uh, one last idea is to think about bedtime or wake up as an opportunity to build in a rhythm, a routine. Uh, if you read my Advent devotional that I wrote back in December during the season of Advent, I shared with you the blessing that I do with my daughter every night at bedtime. Now, I got this idea from a mentor of mine, uh, but I wrote my own. And when I got my daughter, I got her from the NICU and didn't know how long she would be staying. I didn't know if we would have the opportunity to adopt her or if she would be returning to her birth parents. And so I wanted to make sure that her time with us was as meaningful as it could possibly be. And so building in just another tradition at bedtime um, was part of what I did. And so from the first night I brought her home, um, when I put her to bed, I stretch my finger across her forehead and I say, may the blood of Jesus cover you. May the love of Jesus fill you. And I did that, that symbol of the cross, uh, to be reminiscent of Ash Wednesday, that idea of that cross on your forehead, because I always found a lot of meaning when my pastor would do that for me as they were imposing the ashes on my forehead. So I thought, how cool would that be to have that just built into your day? And then I conclude by saying, and may you sleep in God's peace. And then she gets a big kiss on her cheek. And now she's three and doesn't think she should get the big kiss on her cheek. Um, but I'm hoping she gets over that soon and we can, we can go back to that. Um, other families will do prayers or readings or a special song to build that rhythm or routine into their day. Some families are really awesome and have wake up rituals. We're lucky if we get out the door in the morning. So we haven't gotten that far yet. But all of that to say, um, there's a lot of great ways that we can build rhythm and routine into our practices with our kids. And that can build meaning, it can help them build their faith, and it's also a lot of fun. And my kids really look forward to those things. So they know Easter is coming, and so they're looking forward to our Easter traditions, our rhythms, our routines, because that helps build meaning for them as well. So do you have questions? Are there, are there points of discussion you wanna throw out there? How can we continue the conversation? Anyone wanna come over and make resurrection rolls with us? How do you delineate between like they're just like having fun being kids doing these activities and they're actually gleaning something from it. That's tricky. I, I think there's a lot of overlap in that for sure. Um, because I think you can be learning while having fun. And I think some of it is just developmental. So you start planting the seeds of a practice and once you repeat it enough and they grow in maturity, then they begin to understand the meaning behind it. Um, there's an author, um, Walt Wingren, and he talks about the idea of planting seeds of faith so that a, he, his theory is that kids are naturally wired to be in relationship with God. And if we do a good job growing up and helping them grow in, and nurturing them in that, then they begin to understand that connection that was already pre-wired within them. And training them in the faith is actually about giving them words for what they know intrinsically, but they don't have the verb verbiage to be able to talk about. Um, and so if we follow that line of thinking that we're already pre-wired for God, it's just a process of giving them the words and the experiences and the tools to articulate what they were already born hardwired with inside of them. So I like that line of thinking. And I think there's some truth to that. I think we are all pre-wired with the capacity to be in relationship with God. And when we nurture our kids well, when they're really young, we sort of give them the framework to make use of that wiring. A follow-up question one of the students uh, one asked was, how do you start building faith in children who do not come from a religious background? So that's kind of a follow-up of what you're talking about. 
Sure. Well, and it, it lends itself to my foster experience too, because none of the children that I had in foster care had much faith background. Um, I kind of just threw them in the deep water. So we just started going to church and started building those practices just as our normal family routines. And in some ways, maybe initially, they didn't know the difference between a faith practice and every Friday we have pizza for dinner. It's all just part of building that routine initially. And then as we continue to talk about it, because part of it is we, we talk about it again and again. And that's what Deuteronomy tells us that Jewish families did back at the beginning. They talked about the faith as they walked down the road, as they sat down, as they went through their day. It was just a constant, we're always talking about it. And then we begin to give them the words to shape that experience. So every week at home church, I ask, why do we light the Christ candle? And one could say, well, that's redundant. You asked them that the week before and the week before, but that's not the point. The point is we practice it again and again. We review it again and again um, because there's meaning in that. Just like we take communion again and again. We don't say once and done, but Jesus said, do this as often as you think of it. So it's that idea of repetition has value. Have you ever had any um, like rituals or liturgies at home uh, kind of go badly or the kids just didn't like them and you had to kind of switch? I'm sure that's happened. <laughs> Parenting is about trial and error. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I mean, some have definitely morphed over the years where we got better at making things work in our family. Um, I'm trying to think of a good disaster story and I usually have plenty. Um, I just don't have one coming to mind right now. Let me think on that, Becca. Maybe one will pop into mind in a minute. But I would definitely say it's always about like, after every holiday, I sort of do a little informal eval, like what went well, what didn't go well, what would I do differently next year? And then I make notes of that. And for years and years, I kept saying, I want to do something for All Saints Day with my kids. And I just kept forgetting. And then this past year on Halloween, I was like, ah, All Saints Day is tomorrow. Like I thought I would do something nice, maybe laminated cards, lovely cards. And all I had were three by fives. And I was like, okay, I'm just going for it. We just, we just got to do it. We got to start somewhere. And it actually went better than I thought. Um, and so it sometimes it's just, let's just start somewhere and then we'll see where we go. And then I did realize there's one grandpa I don't have a picture of. And so I need to get a picture of that grandpa um, so that we have a full set of all of the, the relatives that we're remembering on All Saints Day. Other questions? Do you have anything else, Dr. Wistrom? I do not. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for um, cutting uh, some paper along with me and trying a little experiment. Um, building rhythms with kids can be a lot of fun. So I enjoy it. Working with kids in a ministry setting is a great role. So change your major, be a children's min major. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for sharing with us this afternoon uh, some fascinating ideas and some things that we can use to morph into uh, uh, other practices as well uh, for both our families and for our ministry opportunities. I'm thinking of a, a couple of things that you've said that I'm going to take back to our children's pastor uh, and share with them as well. So um, thank you very much for being with us.